Hello everyone and welcome to the inaugural edition of Who Wore It Better, my new weekly segment which I compare each week's Raw and SmackDown and try to determine which show won for that week. So let's begin. Beginning with the highlights from this week's Raw, first of all, Enzo Amore was involved in his second straight opening segment, which is no small feat, uh, good on him. That led to the singles match between himself and Chris Jericho. Kevin Owens was in Jericho's corner. Big Cass was in Enzo's corner, which of course is going to lead to the tag team match between the two teams at SummerSlam. The reunion of Jericho, uh, Jericho that is, is now official. So I'm really looking forward to that match. Braun Strowman with his third straight jobber squash. It's interesting that there are two concurrent angles, both on Raw, in which a relatively new person beats up a jobber every week. And Nia Jax took the week off from beating the jobber this week, but Braun Strowman's been up for three weeks now, and Nia Jax did it for two. You know, when I said a few weeks ago after the first uh, post-Battleground Raw that I'd like to see more jobbers, I was kind of hoping I'd see him fight more than just two people. A contrast in promo styles as Finn Balor and Seth Rollins get ready for the Universal Championship match at SummerSlam. Seth Rollins was live at the show and delivered a promo in the ring, which at times I thought was a very good promo. When he got fired up and getting uh, defensive about how he fought to get everything that he got in, in his time in, in wrestling, it was a very good promo, very passionate promo. Unfortunately, the crowd could not have carried less. You could hear a pin drop in Anaheim. A uh, very bad crowd for the whole show. They only popped maybe two or three times noticeably uh, throughout the whole show. Not a good crowd. Did not make the show go any faster for me. Um, so, yeah, that was a problem throughout the whole show. But Rollins gave a very good promo in the ring. Finn Balor's promo later in the night was a pre-taped promo in which he gave us all a history lesson about the mythology that his name is based around. I think both promos were very good. It's hard to pick which one was better just in terms of context. It's apples and oranges. One was live. One was pre-taped. One was very well produced. One was just Seth Rollins talking on the mic. So you can't really compare them. You can't say which one of those two were better. Maybe next week we'll see a switch. We'll see Seth Rollins doing something pre-taped and Finn Balor goes live. Or maybe the two will have another live segment or some kind of tag team match to build their whole storyline up. But either way, I think both promos were very good in their own way. But Seth Rollins has definitely suffered because the live crowd sucks so bad. Sheamus and Cesaro had a really good match on Monday night. Better, I thought, in fact, than what they did the week before. But let's talk about that for a second. So you had Sheamus and Cesaro fighting for the second week in a row. You had Darren Young and Titus O'Neil fighting for the second week in a row. If you include Braun Strowman's third straight jobber squash, then what you had was three matches on a three-hour Raw uh, in, a ma in a show full of really short matches, surprisingly short matches for the most part, um, that were repeats of the previous week, which is very counterintuitive to the whole new era philosophy. I know, you know, the joke is new era, same old shit, but I mean, it's just really stuck out on this show, on this night. I, I didn't I didn't like that at all, but I mean, it was a good match for what it was for Seamus and Cesaro, and Cesaro winning, which again, that, that's a bit of a bucking of the trend, because usually in this kind of scenario, Seamus would win this match, and they'd do a rubber match again sometime later. But here you have Cesaro winning last week and this week. Um, maybe they're going to do something down the line at SummerSlam after what happened in the main event, which I'll talk about later. Um, but there you go. It was actually a pretty good match. One of the bigger segments of the night, of course, was Lana and Rusev doing their whole wedding shtick in the middle of the ring. Boy, Lana's accent is just getting weaker by the day. It's quite amazing. And the one thing, the one thing that was almost the final straw for this segment for me, it was, it was getting kind of long and boring before Roman Reigns interrupted, but then you have this big slideshow in the middle of it. That's the last thing this show needed. It was already boring enough as is. You gotta throw in a slideshow as well, a wedding slideshow. That was brilliant. Uh, but then Roman Reigns came and interrupted, which got a, huge, a pretty big pop. It was, it, you know, big for Roman Reigns' pop. Let's just say it wasn't him winning the title big, but it was still pretty big for Roman Reigns, uh, which is a great strategy. But the company bores to death for an hour and a half before Roman Reigns comes out, and suddenly people want to cheer for him. Uh, then they had their fight, and Lana got in the cake, which is you know that's wrestling 101. If there's a cake in the ring, someone's got to wear it by the end of the segment. And Lana sold it like a champ. It was just her sell and her reaction to being in the cake was 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 great. So then that led to what we all knew was going to happen anyway was Rusev uh, defending the U.S. title at SummerSlam against Roman Reigns, which I think is a great move. You know, Roman Reigns, he needed to be demoted from the world title picture. Everyone wanted that, especially after the suspension. So now that's happened. And so he's still in the mid-card. He's still, he's still a threat. So I don't know what's going to happen with the U.S. title at SummerSlam, but I am intrigued by this match. Ring post-itis translates to inflammation of the ring post. That's not exactly what happened to Big E last week, but you got the message, you got the gist of it in the pre-tape promo that Anderson and Gallows had before the very quick match between Gallows and Kofi Kingston. Surprisingly short match. But uh, yeah, they were in the lab coats. They had the, the thing replaying over and over again. I thought it was hilarious. Ring post-itis, they're going to try to make that a thing along with Viperville. Foley and Brian talking in that penultimate segment. Uh, boy, very weird and ultimately kind of pointless. If they just want to get the point across that, okay, Orton and Lesnar aren't going to show up on each other 
to their shows in the rest of this build of SummerSlam, they probably could have gotten that taken care of in like one backstage segment. Uh, but instead, there was all this build all night for Daniel Bryan to show up on Raw, and then they had this really boring just chat in the ring for two really dynamic promo guys. This is a really uh, lame terrible promo, I have to say. But the big surprise was Rusev and Cesaro coming out and then having the impromptu US title match. That was the first time all show, I actually, like, my interest was peaked. Like, oh, this is a surprise. I want to see this. Boy, we sure are late into the show. The overrun's gonna be long, but here we go. And it was actually a really good match. And Cesaro, the workhorse, he wore Sheamus earlier in the night, working Rusev in a very good match with the US title. And, you know, you thought he was gonna win. It was very... Very building up to, oh, maybe this is going to throw a wrench in the plans of SummerSlam with Reigns. How's he going to factor into this? I'm sure a lot of people were watching this to kind of like do the fantasy booking in their heads. But then Sheamus comes out, even despite the screwy finish where Sheamus cost Cesaro the match of the title, I think it was still a very good way to end the show. It was a very strong match. And again, the kind of anything can happen mentality, you know, possibly a repeat of when Sasha Banks won the women's title a few weeks ago. Yeah, I think it was a very good way to close the show. A lot better than the whole whatever they were doing with Foley and Bryan. And so, I mean, it kind of uh, threw me for a loop, but in a good way. Moving on to SmackDown now. First thing I'm going to get out of the way, I hate their interview lady. A good, solid, relatively quick opening segment between Bray Wyatt, Eric Rowan, Dolph Ziggler, and Dean Ambrose. Wyatt delivering a hell of a promo, which of course is super easy for him to do. I think this segment and this whole, his part in the storyline as of right now, even in defeat, he's still being positioned in a very strong spot uh, in the hierarchy in SmackDown. Basically, he seems to be positioned the, as the third wheel, the number three man. As soon as the SummerSlam match is over between Ziggler and Ambrose, Wyatt's just going to slide on in there and challenge the winner of that match. I think it's, it's working out very well for him. Some big congratulations are in order to my friends Mikey O'Shea and Mike Vega, aka Sasha Derevko, who I've managed several times in the past for appearing as the local squash talent in the, the match against American Alpha. You know, didn't get to do much in the match, but you still got to be on TV, which is pretty awesome. So kudos to you guys. So yeah, American Alpha wins in short order, then a big old tag team brawl with all the main tag teams on SmackDown, which is a pretty cool moment. And I'm looking forward to seeing what goes on with those four teams as the weeks go on. Eva Marie continuing her quest to get all of the heat as her spectacular debut was delayed for the second week in a row. First, it was the ankle injury, and uh, this week it was the wardrobe malfunction. Great way to get her heat. It's the female version of Fandango's debut, because you remember uh, for a while he would come out to wrestle, and then he wouldn't wrestle saying they didn't say his name right, so he, he left in protest. So the female version of that, which is brilliant. Del Rio versus Orton happened at the top of the second hour, and for the third week in a row, Orton would sell his shoulder a lot until he stopped. The continuing misadventures of free agent Heath Slater. I love the lower third they give him when he comes out. It's just so generic. It's not even a SmackDown or a Raw graphic. It's just free agent graphic. I love it. Uh, the promos he was cutting before his match with Rhino and afterward with Shane and, and Daniel Bryan uh, was good stuff where he's getting the, the, the number of his kids confused. I thought that was brilliant. Uh, I'm curious to see where it goes now when you know, they, they alluded to at the end of the sketch that, oh, we were going to give him a contract, but now he doesn't want it. So we'll see what happens on Raw. Good first showing by Carmella on Tuesday night as she went over on Natalia with what I thought was a pretty cool leg submission. The finish kind of came out of nowhere considering she sold like for 90% of the match and her comeback was pretty short, but she managed to get the win anyway. I mean, I think it's a good story building into to later weeks between the two of them. The one thing I'll say, and I'm sure I'm not the first person to say this, but she really needs to drop the whole uh, my name is Carmella gimmick because... You know, we don't need two of those promos every week. Enzo's got it. He's got that down pat. He's the better one at it. We don't need a bargain basement version from Carmella. I get that the three of them were together at NXT, but as long as they're separated now with Enzo and Cass on Raw and Carmella on SmackDown, there's no need for her to keep that gimmick. You know, it's just too samey. It's too samey to Enzo Amore. I think she should not do that same thing anymore. Solid tag team main event match between Ambrose and Ziggler, the reluctant partners, against Bray Wyatt and Eric Rowan. SmackDown did a very good job this week of building the world title feud. They bookended the show with it at the beginning and the end. And, uh, Ziggler hitting Ambrose with the accidental, the accidental super kick at the beginning. Ambrose getting his heat back, getting even at the end after the match where they got over, uh, hitting Ziggler with dirty deeds. Uh, you know, I was saying a few weeks ago how skeptical I was with Ziggler being number one contender uh, due to the way he's been booked for the last uh, several months, years, what have you. But, you know, and it's not an overnight process, but they are giving him credibility again. The super kick is ending matches. It's, it's amazing for, for him. So, yeah, it's, it, again, not an overnight process, but because of the smaller roster, and especially because guys like Cena and Styles weren't on the show this week, it gave Ziggler and Ambrose a bigger chance to shine. Uh, so, yeah, Ziggler's looking very good now. You know, like I said, it's not going to happen right away, but if they keep booking him like this, even if he loses at SummerSlam, uh, I think he has the potential to stay in the upper to mid card fighting for the title. So who wins this week? Man, it's going to be a tough call considering both shows nearly put me to sleep.
The highlights for Raw this week included the wedding segment, the birth of Ring Post Ditus, and the US Championship match, not to mention Cesaro Sheamus earlier in the night. And of course, a lot of matches for SummerSlam were either made official or they were finalized in the case of Sasha Banks versus Charlotte going one on one, no outside interference from Dana Brooke. SmackDown had some good matches, but nothing to write home about, and a couple of my friends ended up on TV as jobbers. Raw was more boring for a longer period of time this week, but I'm going to give them the nod in this inaugural edition of Who Wore It Better, and let me tell you why. They had the edge because they had the surprise of the main event match at the end. There were no surprises, no big big revelations on SmackDown, no sudden changes, but with uh, Raw, you had this boring promo with uh, Daniel Bryan and Mick Foley, and then you're thrown for a loop when the U.S. title match is announced at the very end of the show, and this actually happens. Raw and SmackDown both need surprises to stay interesting. They don't necessarily have to be like satisfying endings. Again, the, the finish to the main event on Monday was very screwy, but as long as you keep to keep fans guessing throughout the show, that's the, that's the spice of life. That's what keeps people interested. I didn't care about the show. I was falling asleep until that match was made official. So there you go. I think the surprise really helped Raw get one over on SmackDown this week. Let me know which show you thought won this week in the comments section below, and be sure to stay tuned every Wednesday morning for a new episode of Who Wore It Better. Be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, and buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.